Well, hey, podcast family, and welcome to another episode of the L3 Leadership Podcast, where we are obsessed with helping you grow to your maximum potential and to maximize the impact of your leadership. My name is Doug Smith, and I am your host, and today's episode is brought to you by my friends at Bear Tongue Advisors. If you're new to the podcast, welcome. I'm so glad that you're listening, and I hope that you'll enjoy our content. And if you do, I hope that you'll become a subscriber and share our content with others. And if you've been listening to us for a while, thank you so much for being a listener. Make sure that you're subscribed. And if we've added value to your life, it would mean the world to me if you would leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. That really does help us grow our audience and reach more leaders. So thank you in advance for that. In today's episode, you're going to hear my conversation with Daniel Harkavy, and I've been looking forward to this conversation for a long time. I was actually first introduced to Daniel's work in 2008, and I'm recording this in 2021, um, when he started working with Michael Hyatt to develop a life plan. And it was the first time I was exposed to a life plan framework. And I created a life plan in 2008, and it was a game changer then. And it's something that I revisit and work on every year. And in fact, all of our mastermind groups, part of the requirement of being in a group is that they actually create their own life plan using Daniel's book, Living Forward, that he co-authored with Michael Hyatt. And so I've been a huge Daniel fan for well over a decade, and I've been following him for a long time. And so it was such an honor to get to speak to him. And I really enjoyed our conversation. And uh, I always admired Daniel from a distance, but getting to know him through this conversation, I admired him in a totally uh, new level, and I'm just so grateful for the work that he does. Um, so let me just tell you a little bit about Daniel for those who may not be familiar. He's been coaching business leaders to peak levels of success, performance, profitability, and fulfillment for over 25 years. In 1996, he harnessed his passion for coaching teams and leaders and founded Building Champions, where he currently serves as CEO and executive coach. Over the past two decades, he and his team of coaches have worked with thousands of clients and organizations implementing the plan and living forward. He lives just outside of Portland, Oregon with his wife and actively serves his community as a member of nonprofit boards and a mentor to those seeking leadership advice. He's a proud father of four and an avid surfer. And as I mentioned earlier, you're going to love this conversation. But before we get into the interview, just a few announcements. This episode of the L3 Leadership Podcast is sponsored by my friends at Bear Tongue Advisors. The financial advisors at Bear Tongue Advisors help educate and empower clients to make informed financial decisions. You can find out how Bear Tongue Advisors can help you develop a customized financial plan for your financial future by visiting their website at BearTongueAdvisors.com. That's B E R A T U N G Advisors.com. Securities and investment products and services offered through Waddell and Reed Inc., member FINRA and SIPC. Bear Tongue Advisors, Waddell and Reed, and L3 Leadership are separate entities. I also want to thank our sponsor, Henny Jewelers. They're a jeweler owned by my friend and mentor, John Henny. And my wife, Laura, and I got our engagement and our wedding rings at Henny Jewelers, and we just absolutely love them as an organization. Not only do they have great jewelry, but they also invest in couples. In fact, every couple that comes into their store to get engaged, they give them a book to help them prepare for marriage, and we just love that. So if you're in need of a good jeweler, check out HennyJewelers.com. And with all that being said, let's dive right into the interview. Here's my conversation with Daniel Harkavy. Well, hey, Daniel, thank you so much for doing this interview. I've been looking forward to this for a long time. I've been greatly impacted by your work, and uh, I can't wait. But why don't we start the interview with you just telling us and our audience a little bit about who you are and what you do? Well, it's great to be with you. Thank you for having me. You know, the quick disclaimer I, I told you before we hit record is I'm sitting out in a in a yard in San Diego. So if you hear any hear any yard noises listening to the podcast, forgive me. We're trying to be professional, but... Uh, uh, taking care of some family things down here in California as I get to, to uh, share with you all. So it's good to be here. So uh, me, I am, uh, I am 32 years married to my best friend. We met when we were like 11. Hmm. And uh, Jerry and I have been doing life together now for almost 46 years. So 32 of it married and, and the rest of it just kind of in each other's lives and dating and friends and all that. And we have four kids, um, two of them married. We have two grandkids and then we've had nine other kids living with us over the years. So, uh, home life and personal life is rich. I'm a, a man of faith, uh, without Christ, I'm nothing. And, uh, I love surfing. I love the outdoors, love snowboarding, anything where I can be out in the, the environments, my release. And, uh, and what I get to do day in and day out for the last 25 years is I get to 
lead a company that journeys with leaders to help them to lead their businesses and their lives better. And that's Building Champions. And I spend a, a lot of my time there. And then I recently started a, another entity. I've got a few different things cooking, but the one I'm really excited about now, which is a new one, is called Set Path. And that's a not-for-profit where we're bringing life planning and mentorship to America's youth. We're going to hmm. try to, we're going to try to instill some hope and belief into uh, America's, let will just say 15 year old, the 30 year old in these crazy times. So that tells you a little bit about me. Well, I love that. I, I want to dive right into that. Um, I first heard of you and got impacted by your work through Michael Hyatt. Um, hmm. Before you guys co-wrote a book together on creating a life plan, he had blogged about it and the impact that you had on his life, uh, putting together a life plan. And I think he shared a template way back then. And so I think in around 2008, I gave my first crack at a life plan, uh, thanks to your work. And, and then you guys released the book together. And now uh, at L3 Leadership, we have mastermind groups. And the first thing we have people go through is living forward and creating a life plan. And so um, thank you for your influence on, on me and my family and everyone that we have influence over. Uh, we point people right to you. And so, so let's, good. let's talk a little bit about creating a life plan and living forward. So you've been coaching leaders for over 25 years, but can you just talk a, a little bit about what is a life plan and, and why do people need one? Yeah. A life plan is basically, you know, let, let's just talk business for a minute. A life plan is, is a business plan for um, your life. So for all of you who operate off of business plans or responsible for creating and executing on them, it's the same concept. It's a GPS for your life and it's written by you. It's written for you. And it helps you to gain clarity on the areas of your life that are truly most important to you, helps you to imagine what could be and who you'd like to be in the years ahead, causes you to be intentional with thinking about that, and then identifying steps that can move you from where you're at in the areas of your life that are truly most important. And the reason it's so key is I believe self-leadership always precedes team leadership. So how we lead ourselves matters for us as business leaders. So there's a business reason for this, but beyond business, I, uh, I can't stand hanging out with people that are in their fifties, sixties, and seventies and, and hearing their stories of regret because they've mm -hmm. poured all of their energy and given their best to their businesses and maybe to their financial situation or material things. And, and then they, they share regret because they gave their leftovers to areas of their life that would have brought them even more significance, more happiness, more fulfillment and joy, and they missed. And you can't go back and, and recap time. So a life plan is a plan that's this GPS for your life and you don't serve it, it serves you, it's dynamic and it helps you to see what you wanna fill your days with. It's a really great tool. And just out of curiosity, how did, how did this even get on your radar in your life? You know, did you have a mentor share this with you? Did you make this up because you saw a need? Yeah. So the concept of life planning was introduced to me by a guy named Todd Duncan, who was a trainer in the mortgage banking space back when I was in my 20s. And, uh, and then I, I understood the concept. It was more of a goal setting kind of strategy. And I did some work. Uh, I took a one-year sabbatical at the age 30 and and I just did some work on kind of life mapping for myself. And then I created our process, which, you know, I read Bob Buford's book, Halftime, back then. This was, you know, probably, what, 25 to 30 years ago. I read that book. And, and in that book, he talked about how a mentor of his had him write his eulogy and how that impacted him. So I wrote my eulogy mm. at the age 30, 31. I was like, it's a pretty cool exercise. It aligns the head with the heart. That's that's really important. The head's easily deceived. And we always think we can get to it tomorrow. We always think we can, can take care of you know, them or that later. We'll have time. But the truth of the matter is we, we don't have a guarantee of time. And uh, a lot of people make the mistake of thinking they can do what matters most next week. And, and something happens to where that opportunity doesn't come. So I incorporated that piece. And, and then I just started kind of tweaking things and, and building it out. And over the years, we've really not changed it much. Um, but I created the process and started walking leaders through it because I could look at any leader and say, you know what, I don't care if I make, help you to make a, a few extra hundred thousand or grow your market share by X. If it costs you your life, I'm not interested. So I want to know that if I'm going to help you, I'm going to help you as a full human and, uh, going to help you to be, uh, building equity and net worth in all areas of your life. And that will help you to be a better business leader. So there you go. 
That's so good. And that, that's my heartbeat for why I invest in leaders every day. That is, uh, that is incredible. And so talk to leaders listening. And if you're listening, I already mentioned, if you haven't gotten the book Living Forward by Daniel and Michael Hyatt, can't recommend it enough. We give it away all the time. But someone's listening and saying, you know, that sounds awesome. I want to create a life plan. Where can people start? And can you walk us through that process? Yeah, you, you go to uh, the book website, livingforwardbook.com, I believe, or just look us up on Google and you'll get a direct address. But we give you the life planning tool. And in the book, I walk you through, we walk you through, Michael and I walk you through our process. And, and uh, it's step-by-step. Step. It's picking a day. It's writing out your eulogy so you connect head and heart. There's a Hebrew scripture, Psalm 90, 12, that says, so teach us to number our days so that we may gain a heart of wisdom. And you need to do that. If you're going to have a, a life plan that, that uh, taps into the deepest parts of you, you need to understand there is no guarantee of next week. There is no guarantee of next year. So you have to come to that, that reality that we're not guaranteed this abundance of time. And when you do that, then as the psalmist was saying, help me to number my days so that I may gain a heart of wisdom. Conviction is found in the heart. Conviction is where decisions get made in the midst of challenge or in the midst of temptation. Conviction is birthed in the heart. And when you're convicted by things, it's easier to make decisions. So you make the right decisions instead of drifting off to areas that might seem nice or might feel good in the short run. So you write out your eulogy, that prepares you for it. You write out legacy statements, that prepares you to build your life plan, then you write your life plan. You identify each of your accounts, craft a vision for where you'd like to be at some point in the future. You identify your purpose. What's your purpose in each one of these accounts? You, uh, you uh, assess where you are from a current reality perspective. Now we're talking GPS. This is where I'm at. Vision is where I want to go. Purpose is who I want to be in the account and how I want to serve it. Then the next step is you identify a few steps you can take on a daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, annual basis that will help you to accumulate net worth in all areas of your life so that you don't wind up bankrupt or in a deficit place in accounts in your life later on that might matter most to you. So you take a day, you build this thing out. And if you go to the book website or you go to Building Champions website under um, tools and resources, we give all this stuff away. You can grab the life plan tool and uh, you can just go for it. And there's a ton out there on, on social media and everywhere else where I walk people through it. And, and the book's a great resource. Yeah. Can you speak to leaders who, who maybe they've done this exercise like myself and what are the best ways to maximize a life plan after you write one? So it doesn't just sit on a shelf for 30 years. Uh, yeah. what, what do you encourage leaders to do with it? Review it every day for 90 days and then every week for the rest of your life. Wow. Uh, take a, about an hour every quarter and do a, a just a evaluation what's working, what's not working. Take a full day every year. I like December and uh, in December um, do a, an overhaul of it and see what matters most and see where you need to adjust. And uh, it's pretty straightforward. You just make it a tool that serves you. Yeah. Do you have any, I'm just curious, do you have any other unique tools or habits that you, you really help leaders with in addition to the life plan that you recommend? Yeah. Life planning is just where you begin. I mean, that's life. I've got so many tools and so many frameworks to help leaders to best lead themselves and their businesses, their teams. So everything from how to build a clear and compelling vision to uh, how to improve execution, execution through one page planning, to how to understand how to improve leadership effectiveness by uh, the seven perspectives framework, to how to evaluate uh, team and business um, overall efficacy by taking ground. I, I've got model after model. So good. Now that we're talking, I want to dive into some of your leadership and coaching things you were just talking about, but you mentioned your new nonprofit that you're really excited about and, and really getting life plan into kids. If there's a teacher listening, if there's a, a youth pastor listening, someone who influences kids and they're saying, man, that would be awesome for me to use to, to influence kids. Can you just tell people where to connect to get that? Setpath.com. It's free. We'll train you. We'll welcome you into a community. We'll equip you. You'll be better in every area of your life if you become a guide. And uh, we'll give you everything you need. Won't cost you anything other than your time. And wow. uh, if you've got connection to the young folks, then we'll equip you to make an even greater difference in their lives. Setpath.com. That's amazing. We'll put a link to that in the show notes. Make sure you take advantage Thank of it you. if you influence young leaders. Um, Thank you. 
Yeah. I want to talk to you about coaching. And so you've been coaching leaders for, you know, 20 plus years and uh, just talk to leaders. Why does, why do, why does a leader need a coach? I don't, I don't, you know, I don't believe all leaders need a coach. Um, Hmm. I think leaders who have a, a a deep belief or need to grow, uh, they want a thinking partner. Well, then a coach can really help them. Uh, But I think coaches can help different leaders at different times. Uh, I really believe that for, you know, the highest level of executive leaders, they need that safe thinking partner, somebody who's got the, the mental chops and the overall understanding of their business and their life, who can then ask them the questions that nobody else will ask them, or who will encourage them in really unique ways, where they may not be getting that encouragement. So I look at some of my, my clients who, you know, their organizations are 300,000 people, they're global. Um, They're huge. I mean, huge, multi-billion dollar, hundred year old, you know, global entities that are iconic brands. And some of these leaders, yeah, they've got a board and they've got family, they've got a spouse and they've got friends, but they can't truly talk about what they're thinking, feeling and dealing with, with anybody, because there's some, there's something to gain or lose in those conversations, even with board members. So the, the CEO can go to an executive coach, a CEO mentor, and that saying it's lonely at the top really gets debunked when you've got a thinking partner Hmm. who you can run everything through their thinking just to, to make sure you're on, on point. And, uh, and you can be transparent, you can be vulnerable. So I look at a, a, a coach for leaders, and that's at the highest of level, and then I can take it all the way down through front-facing managers, where coaches will just help them to improve how they manage and how they lead, how they think about leadership, how they think about themselves, what they believe about themselves, others, opportunity, you know, frameworks to help them to go further, faster. I think about entrepreneurial start, uh, you know, startups where, you know, entrepreneurs can have a coach who's been there, done that and will help them to avoid pitfalls and mistakes. In my most recent book, The Seven Perspectives of Effective Leaders, um, I I added the seventh perspective after years of saying it was five perspectives and then six, I added the seventh, which is the outsider as a result of me just one morning reflecting on my last few days of activity and and realizing, man, these leaders, they just want somebody to think with. Hmm. And boy, does it help them. You know, I've got 25 years of doing this and tens of thousands of people, my, my coaches, you know, there's 20, I think 25 of us coaches that all we do is we walk with leaders and we see it. Yeah. Can you talk about your journey? Maybe this wasn't a journey at all for you, but uh, you have a lot of coaches on your team too. Is there a lot of insecurity when you first started working with, with organizations? You know, I think about the prospect of going into a a leader's office that's responsible for 300,000 people and saying, Hey, I have something to offer you. Can you talk about your journey from, you know, when you started to where you are now and how can coaches grow in confidence? Insecurity. I don't even know what you're talking about. I've always been (laughs) confident. Sure. Dude, I still deal with insecurity. I can tell you some of the most crazy stories where I'm sitting there going, really? I get to talk to this guy. He wants to hire me. Are you kidding me? I have nothing to to offer to him. I, I just, Oh, I've dealt with insecurity my whole life. Um, you know, the way that, all right, all right. So you asked me to, to go back. You know, I started building champions when I was 31 years old. Hmm. I had spent 10 years in mortgage banking and I'd climbed the ladder in mortgage banking to where the, the position I left was the head of production. So I had 200 and some people reporting to me. I got to serve them in locations throughout the Western United States. And then I took this one year sabbatical. I moved my family from Southern Cali- California here to Oregon. And, uh, and I've got three different business ideas. And, and the one that really um, resonated with me most and got me most excited was this coaching deal because I got to take the best part of my old job, which was just pouring into people and helping them to grow. And I can possibly make a living at it. Wow. So in the beginning, I thought it would work. All right, big deal thought it'd work. Then I started to experience the testimonies and see the growth in my clients. And, and I started to gain confidence. And as I gained confidence, uh, then I went from thinking it work would work to actually knowing it would work. And then I started working with organizations that would actually do, um, uh, they would do coached versus non-coached peer assessments on performance. 
and the results would come back that the coached versus non-coached would outperform their non-coached peers in four quadrants of performance. And then I went from knowing it worked to really believing it would work. Hmm. Okay, now 30 to now 56, almost 57. Yeah, mid 40s, I went from thinking it would work to knowing it would work to believing it worked would work to being convicted by the wow. fact that it works. So today, as a guy with you know no hair on the head and gray hair on the chin, I have the ability to sit down with any leader of any organization and say, you know what, I absolutely believe this works. I'm convicted by it. And if you don't see it, it's your loss or I'm the wrong guy and we're the wrong company. And it's okay, let's just move on. But if you work with us, your organization's going to have lift as are you. End of story. So then you're just looking for the people hmm. that would benefit from what it is you bring because you know what you bring adds value. But, you know, this is 25 years of doing this day in and day out. You, you grow in security. So today I'm secure, but I'll still have insecure moments. You know, you listeners, you need to know this. I don't have a college degree. Um, hmm. You know, I was not a, a good student in high school probably read one book before I was 18. So uh, I got all sorts of good reasons to be insecure, but over time you deal with it and you understand who you are and why you're here. Now I'm just going to be curious. I mean, did you not do well in school and not go to college because you weren't a great student or, you know, was your life headed a horrible direction and something significant happened? Oh, I, 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 uh, I grew up in, uh, in, in an area where I, so I'm Jewish um, both parents Jewish, all grandparents Jewish, and there was not uh, a, a lot of Jewish kids where I grew up. And I grew up, you know, born in 64. So 60s and 70s, there was still a pretty high degree of anti-Semitism. Mm-hmm. And I was small and I wasn't the smartest and I wasn't a jock. And so I, I grew up and I made a move um, from one part of town to another part of town at the age 10. And I just didn't fit in. So uh, every kid needs to belong. And as a Jewish kid, if you're dealing with some anti-Semitism and you're small, you learn to run really fast. And at some point you turn around and you start to fight hmm. and you need to belong. Kids need to belong. So if I don't belong to the jocks and I don't belong to the smart kids and I don't belong to the, belong to the Jewish kids, because there's five of us in a school and they're not my people, you go to where you're accepted. And at that time I go from runner to little bully. And uh, I was a drummer and a skateboarder and then became surfer. So just think about that. Southern California, drummer, surfer, you know what comes next, partier, girl guy. You know, that was, yeah, so I was a mess. I did a lot of damage in my teen years and uh, had a big life transformation at the age 22. And that's when I had a big faith change and found for me, you know, my Messiah, who was the Messiah of the Jews um, in my faith and how I believe and uh, things changed. So, um, you know, the not, not being a good student and the not going to college, uh, I, I took just a, a much different path. I was always money motivated as a kid. I always worked really hard, but school for me was just not all that interesting. Hmm. So. Thank you for yeah. sharing that. Sure. Um, you made a, a statement on your website that I love. You said better humans equal better leaders. I just want to hear you talk about that. Yeah, you just, you people, we humans, we're looking for, we're looking for the real deal. Hmm. We're looking for humans to follow that are making a difference in all of the areas of their life. And they're not sacrificing. They think well, they believe well, they behave well, they love well, they take care of themselves and those around them well. They're good thinkers. They're better humans. They're just good people. So if you understand that, well, then it's pretty easy to realize, you know what, if you've got a good human who's well-grounded and they are, they are trying to give and to love and to serve in all areas of their life, and they're doing it in a healthy way, well, chances are they're going to make for a better leader. Whereas if you have a leader who is all in it for ego, who is all in it for self-gain, who is all in it because they've got mental chops, And they want to feed that mental beast, but they don't have people chops and they don't have the influence side. Well, at some point they break down and the organization suffers. So you need to be looking at leaders who are going to think about the whole structure, the whole business, all of the interrelated parts. Business is always operated by people. 
people are the magic. They're the ones that make it or break it. They innovate, they execute, they relate, they bring in, they account for, they design, they engineer, it's people. So we humans make conscious and subconscious decisions about how engaged we'll be with our leaders based upon how our leaders treat themselves and everyone around them and their competence. So we're looking at the whole package, conscious and subconscious. We're making these engagement decisions. Better humans make for better leaders. Hmm. If you're a better human, you speak very well of your spouse. You leave when you want to leave so you can pour into your kids. You show up ready for meetings and you just crush it. You're thinking about the right things. You're not sitting down micromanaging and acting insecure. You're empowering, you're equipping, you're thinking not just about how to manage today, but how to take us to where we want to go tomorrow. You take care of your health. You don't have all these addictions and you're not all whacked out. People are going to want to follow you. So good. You talked, I mean, that includes a lot about perspective and you recently, you've mentioned it already. You've recently wrote a book called seven perspectives of effective leaders. You actually already talked about one of the perspectives, the outsider, um, but you mentioned seven perspectives in a book, current reality, long-term vision, strategic bets, the team, the customer, your role and the outsider. Just talk about it. Can you just share with the audience why you wrote this book and maybe talk about one or two of the perspectives? Yeah. So uh, about six years ago, I came up with the framework, the five perspectives of effective leaders. And I started working with clients and bringing their executive teams around this to help them to make better decisions and have more influence. I like to take things that seem to be complicated. And for me, I like to make them easy. Like I just need the easy. So when you really look at a leader, what makes for an effective leader? Not a good leader, not a good leader. A good leader has to have integrity, has to care, you know, has to understand the business, right? But to be an effective leader, you make great decisions and you have maximum influence. And you think about that. Then you think about everything that falls into one of those two buckets. And, and Doug, I have been with leader after leader, many of them who have been on your podcasts. They're in my book. Um, I've interviewed so many of them and said, hey, challenge me. Am I right or am I wrong? There's only two, two things that a leader needs, decision-making and influence. Everything's going to fall into one of those two. Do you agree or disagree? And through debate and discussion, they all sit down and they go, you know what? You're freaking right. It's two. <laughs> it's two. All right. So how do you make better decisions and how do you grow in influence? What do you need to be doing? Leadership's so complicated. There's so many things a leader can be doing. Every one of you who are listening and who are leaders, you know you go to bed every night knowing you just didn't get it all done. Leaders who sleep well go to bed at night knowing they got the right things done. Mm -hmm. All right. Two words, intentional curiosity. The best leaders are so humble that they are actually intentionally curious. Every day they wake up, what can I learn today? What do I need to see today? Who do I need to talk to today? What questions do I need to ask? You can tell a man is wise, not by the answers that he gives, but by the questions he asks. So great leaders are intentionally curious. Well, where do they direct that curiosity? Well, they intentionally spend time Monday through Friday, understanding current reality, long-term vision, strategic bets, the team, the customer, their role and how it needs to adjust and the outsider. The first three of the perspectives are all about management and understanding and execution. Current reality. If you don't understand current reality, then you become the ivory tower disconnected leader. You don't understand how to manage the business today. You don't understand what it's like to do the business today. And if that place, your teammates are running around cleaning up messes and they're having all sorts of sidebar conversations because the leader just doesn't get it. Perspective two, long-term vision. Where are we going? Where are we going? Where are we going? If you don't paint a picture of a better tomorrow, and if it's not going to stretch us, well, then the best people don't want to be a part of it because nobody wants to come to work to create mediocrity. Nobody wants to just maintain and manage. They all want to trade in their hours to create something good. Long-term vision paints a picture that's worth sacrificing for and that shows us that if we stretch, we can accomplish something better. And great leaders repeat that and believe that and then execute on that. Perspective three. Perspective three are about strategic bets. If you're grounded in current reality right now, and then you throw this anchor way out there to long-term vision, well, you create a gap and that's called the opportunity gap. 
the, the reason that 75% of all businesses fail to execute on strategy, because they're not grounded, they're not anchored. But if you're always building strategic bets that you think will pay off, that are grounded in current reality and anchored to long-term vision, well, then you're going to increase the odds of those bets being executed on and then paying off. Then you move current reality forward to long-term vision. Those are all about management and leadership basics. And you need to have those in order to have the, the complete buy-in from all key constituents to really lead the business well. And key constituents need to speak into those. So I'll take a breath because I could keep going and hit the next you know, four perspectives, but I want to give you a chance to, to riff and, and direct me however you want. No, that's so good. And, and I'd really encourage people to obviously go and get the book. Um, I am curious when it comes to business and this, I guess, kind of goes back to the coaching too, but um, I would love to hear your perspective on, on pricing. Uh, I mean, obviously you built a company and again, going back to the insecurity question of, you know, you starting out, what have you learned about pricing over, the, over your time in your coaching career? I'm just curious. Pricing of coaching services? Yeah. I mean, it could be any yeah. business really just determining pricing, but specifically, yeah, you're in the coaching business. I'm just curious, you know, is that an area that you had to grow in? Um, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I would love to hear you just speak on that journey. Yeah. So what happens is, you know, it comes back to your insecurity question earlier. Yeah. And what I charge today, I was not worth when I was 31. I wasn't worth it. You know, if I would have tried to go out at age 31 with my prices today, I wouldn't have had a business. I wouldn't have ever had a shot. So what happens is you go out there and you pressure test your, your pricing. And for me, what I did was when I started building champions at the age 31, I didn't have some like huge economic goal. What I wanted was I wanted to spend my days making a difference, but I wanted to be pa paid fairly so that I didn't have money worries so that I could be the husband and the father that I wanted to be. I could be the steward of what I had, but I wasn't going to worship money. So I actually built a plan that would enable me to make a fraction of what I made in mortgage banking. I was willing to take a huge pay cut. And, you know, in, in banking in my 20s, I made stupid money, stupid money. And, uh, and so when I started this company, I was like, all right, I'm gonna build it. It's just me. I'm gonna work out of a home office. Um, I, had a, I had a lifestyle because, you know, age really 20 to 30, I was used to making some coin. So I'm just like, you know, I'm gonna make what I wanna make. So I went out there and I did the math and I said, if I spent so many hours a day coaching and I want to make this at the end of the year, well, then this is what I'm going to need to charge. So that's what I did. And I think I went out and I started at like 2000 bucks a client for six months. And, uh, you know, I figured I could, I could annualize that $4,000 a client and I could coach 50, 60 people, make a couple hundred thousand bucks and I could do so on a four day work week. And uh, that's what I'm going to do. And that's what I did. And, <laughs> and then over time, you realize, you know what, you're bringing a heck of a lot more value and you're seeing your clientele grow and, and you're seeing that you're working with not just, um, you know, individual contributors, but you begin working with managers and then regionals and executives and divisionals. And then next, you know, it's CEOs. And then you go from working with companies that make you know, uh, that, that generate 20, 30, 40, 50 million a year in revenue to billions a year. And then you look at who they're comparing you against. So today I get at building champions, we run head to head with some of the big boys and I can go in there on a, and put a contract out for a few hundred thousand or, you know, maybe a million when one of the big, big boys will put a contract out there for 5 million. We're still the cheapest in town, hmm. but we're very expensive in comparison to you know, building champions 20 years ago. So you grow into it and, um, and you pressure test, you know, you pressure test, um, do your research, see what's, what others are charging in the space. We just did a competitive analysis. It's the second time we've done a competitive analysis in five years. Hmm. We just look, who's our competition? What's the market for our type of product? What's our brand worth? Why should we earn more? What happens if we drop pricing on these? Um, offerings? Do we get more critical mass? Can we serve more people? Are we running into to ceiling pressure? We look at all that. Thank you for sharing that. It was extremely insightful for me. Um, with the time that we have left, I want to dive into what I call the lightning round. But 
we talked a lot about a lot of ways people can connect with you. We talked about living forward, the new book that you just wrote, uh, coaching champions. Uh, if someone's listening to this and they're saying, you know, I'd be interested in your services for our organization. Can you just tell them where to go? Yeah. What I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to direct you to buildingchampions.com, and that is for executive coaching and leadership development. So if you're a leader or you're on the HR side and you're looking to build leadership capacity, we've got everything from workshops to uh, one-on-one coaching, CEO mentoring, all sorts of virtual offerings. We have products. So there's three books that a lot of um, our clients will utilize the frameworks from. Becoming a coaching leader helps you with your one-on-one uh, development. And one, you know, if you're trying to improve engagement and performance, I wrote Becoming a Coaching Leader back in 2007 and just created an e-course on it. And it's right now in, tw- in 2021 when we're recording it, it's one of the hottest products we have. And we just launched the, the e-course last year, Living Forward, is all about life planning. And then the seven perspectives of effective leaders is the most recent book. And uh, we're doing executive retreats on that. And um, we have a whole bunch of resources uh, at that website as well. And you can find all of it at buildingchampions.com. Awesome. Let's dive right into the lightning round. What is the best advice you've ever received and who gave it to you? So when I was in mortgage banking, Ooh, boy, oh boy, the best. I mean, if you want to share too, I'd be fine with that. Well, I've been talking one about one recently. I just lost an aunt. Hmm. And when I was a young punk kid, I was a, like we've already shared, I was a nasty little human. And I remember my aunt looking at me one morning as we were having breakfast. She was making breakfast. And I was just telling my cousins this like a week ago. And she looked at me and she said, back then I was Danny. Now I'm Daniel. So I was immature back then. But anyways, she's like, Danny, you've got a lot of influence. Hmm. And if you figure out how to use that influence for good, you're going to impact a lot of people. But if you stay the course and you use that influence for bad, I'm afraid to see who you're going to turn out to be. And I just remember that I was probably 11 years old and I just like, oh, no. And, and that stuck with me. Um, so like that was this belief paradigm for me. Wow. Clem Zaroli Sr., Clem Zaroli Sr., the founder of First Mortgage Corporation. Clem um, took me under his wing. He saw me. He, he saw what I could be when I was in my teens. And I was working construction. And I was working as a, as a tabletop technician, also busboy at Velvet Turtle. He would come in and he would always like talk to me and try to get me to join his mortgage banking firm. And, and he was the one who said, don't go to college. I can help you to make a heck of a lot more if you'll just follow my path and uh, you'll be further along. And, and he did this like through my teen years and I joined him when I was 20. But I remember him teaching me the lesson of working hard. He said, work hard, be honest, the lesson of integrity, work hard, be integrous. Two huge lessons that uh, he imparted into me. And the other was financial stewardship. Hmm. It's like, you, you don't go out and charge things. You only buy what you can afford. If you go out and, and charge things, you're going to wind up hostage and slave to things that will uh, lead you to make bad decisions in your future. So I always thank Clem for work ethic, hard work, and uh, for that stewardship piece. Yeah, he, he was a great mentor. Yeah, and thanks for sharing the story about your aunt as well. Uh, we have very similar childhood experiences, it sounds like. And uh, I had three different leaders at three different times in my life from, I'd say, 16 to 21, who had the exact same conversation with me. And so, mm. leaders, if you're listening to this, I just want to encourage you, if you see young punks like Danny and Dougie, <laughs> mm. uh, please speak into their life if you see uh, man potential in them, because you could change their life forever. So thank you. That was very You're meaningful. welcome. I mean, that's one of the big reasons why I've started Set Path. You know, people need, I I say transferring hope and belief into a young person is one of the greatest things an older person can do. Yes. Just transfer hope and belief into these young people. I just walked through one of the nastiest situations. We've had nine other kids living with us. And on February the 22nd, one of the young ladies that lives with us, her younger brother took his life, 15 year old. And we were the first phone call and Hmm. we had the family living with us for 10 days. And, uh, And, you know, even the night before last, I was up until midnight with one of the siblings and it's been a pretty normal occurrence. I actually got to officiate the memorial five days later. And my passion for us older folks to transfer hope and belief into into America, first and foremost, their youth, our youth, and then going beyond, 
we, we need to do that. Like young people need to know they're here for a reason, they matter and they can make a huge difference. So I echo your uh, encouragement, Mr. Smith. People need yeah. to be looking out for the Duggies and the Dannies. And Will, I see you there. I'm sure you were just a nasty bugger. You were probably worse than both of us. So <laughs> I don't want to hear your stories. They're probably just scary. He's still a Willie. I'm just joking. Will. Still a Willie. <laughs> so uh, you, you piqued my interest. You, I forget how many people you just said are living with you. Can you, can you speak more about that? Is that a, a common practice for your family? Yeah. So right now we don't have nine. We've had nine. Um, okay. We've had nine that have lived with us from 96 through today. We've actually had 11, but nine of them youth. And uh, when I say youth, I'm going to say 30 and under. And seven of the nine came to us with some sort of addiction and just needing some help, needing a safe place, needing some, some uh, mentorship. And, uh, and the other two just needed a place to, to crash and uh, to get solid footing. They, they came from, one of them came from a really difficult situation. So anyways, we've always had extra kids and um, we love it. We get to do that. And uh, they live with us. This, this one sweetheart who is like a daughter to me, she's 17 and, and she moved in. Um, she moved in five days after trying to take her own life. And uh, about a month and a half ago, her younger brother at 15 did. So um, it's full contact sport, but it's rich. And uh, yeah, no better way to invest a life no better way to invest a life is come alongside people and help them to figure it out. And if you've been given, give it away, give it away. So good, Daniel. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. And thank you for doing that. And uh, we get to buddy. No one needs to thank us. We get to. Well, it'll be hard to transition back into some fun questions, but I'm going to do it. Um, Go. If you could, if you could put a quote on a billboard for everyone to read, what would it say? Flip switches up. Flip switches mean? up. Say more so every morning that. I go face down and I, I share my morning prayer with a lot of people. But in the morning I go face down first thing. And first part of my prayer is just an acknowledgement of who God is and who I'm not. And just, again, getting that right. I need that perspective right. I'm created, not creator. Second part is, Lord, help me to see people. No, sorry. Lord, help me to be who you want me to be so that I can do what you want me to do. Help me to see people like you see them. May I serve them in ways that bring you fame and glory. May I love them like you love them. May I strive to please an audience of one and use me to flip the switches up on the hearts of everybody I meet one person at a time. You get the fame, you get the glory. Part two, part three is just interceding for all the pain and the brokenness and my beautiful family and everybody else and everything I get to do. So uh, flipping switches up, you know, it's letting your light shine. It's uh, each of us have an opportunity to affect the other humans that we come into contact with, whether it's at the grocery store, or whether it's a one-on-one -on -one meeting with a teammate, or whether it's with a big client that we want to we want to land, we get to. Sorry about that. Ding, ding, ding. Um, we get to affect people, and it's either positive, it's neutral, or it's negative. And neutral is usually no way to go. And I don't want to be negative, so let's figure out how to stir up loving good works. Flip switches up. What's the best purchase you've made in the last year for a hundred dollars or less? And you're going to ask me that question. I have no clue. I just, <laughs> know. I, I just, I thought about it for a few minutes. Like, I don't know. My, my immediate response was, have I bought anything surfing oriented for a hundred bucks or less? Nope. Uh, no answer. Okay. Uh, do you have a book or two other than your own that you find yourself giving away most often or that has impacted you the most? Hmm. I used to give away all the time. Oh, the places you'll go by Dr. Seuss. You know, the Dr. Seuss, all oh, the places you guys to give that to everybody. Um, I've given away, uh, oh no, brain fade. I see you, I see you. Nope, can't pull that one up. When I knew you were gonna ask that question, um, you know what, where I went was, okay, what am I reading now that I've really enjoyed? Sure. Uh, I'm enjoying Think, uh, Think Again, Adam Grant, super good. Um, uh, thinking fast and slow, uh, excellent. I just listened to, which I loved, Green Light by Matthew McConaughey. Listen huh. to Matt, listen to Matthew talk about life with his pro proverbial wisdom. Oh, it was a fun, <laughs> fun listen. So, and I've recommended all those. You know, if I read something good or listen to something good, 
I mean, Eugene Peterson's right now, pastor, freaking loving that. Hmm. Do you have a favorite podcaster too? Are you a podcast guy? Yeah, I am. I listen to, uh, I, I love how you built this stuff you should know. Um, yeah. Um, I, I used to listen to a lot more in the way of podcasts. I, I, I live in Oregon outside of Portland by about a half an hour and I've got land and uh, I get to, I get to buy a John Deere tractor and uh and mow meadows and spring is when it all starts so i found myself over the last few weeks when i'm on the tractor just zoning um i found myself listening to books more so than podcasts lately hmm. but uh i do enjoy podcasts i mean i could pull up a ton of them but what's impacting me now i still love how i built this i think it's one of the and, and i like uh, stuff you should know it's just an interesting one do you have a favorite failure in your life that led to success or a powerful lesson that you want to, you could share Two thousand and one. Two thousand and one. Uh, one of your guests. You had John Maxwell on, didn't you? Uh, I've had, had lunch. With, I had lunch with John and shared the lessons. But no, okay. I've, I haven't interviewed him yet. Okay, I knew I saw something with you and John. So John and I were doing a lot together back in the late nineties and early two thousands, and and we were looking at bringing our companies together. And uh, you know, John, uh, I coached. John's executive team. And we did a ton with Maxwell. I was doing real teams. We would travel the country together and do all sorts of speaking events together. And it was fun. And, and we were looking at bringing ourselves together, our companies, and there was a challenge that his company had and, and just things fell apart. All right. Just things fell apart. And in 2001, I had invested a ton into a big event, like trained 20 coaches in advance of an event, because we thought we we're going to get 2000 clients. And uh, you know, a new CRM, hundreds of thousands of dollars, all sorts of people and training and everything. We're, we're going to launch during this huge simulcast. The simulcast, it didn't go the way it was supposed to. And um, instead of 2,000 leads, we had 200 leads. <laughs> and, uh, and the way it was going to be positioned versus the way it was positioned during the simulcast didn't go down. And it was just terrible. And John and I are good friends. I love him. Love him, love him. We all fight our balance, our demons, and we, we just, we don't see all of the pieces, uh, especially in difficult times. All right, so the, I get to the end of 2001, and the three lessons are, the throne is for Christ alone. Don't ever put a man there. Manna still happens, and um, God's timing is the right timing. And wow. those lessons of 2001 were the result of me being way off kilter and chasing the wrong things, just chasing the wrong things. What I wanted was I wanted to shortcut success. Wow. I thought, oh, gravy train, I can go from little to huge and it's going to be easy. Hey, whenever it thinks like it, it seems like it's going to be easy, like alert, alert, you're probably on the wrong path because to really succeed and to get to places where you want to go, you're going to sweat and you're going to get your fingernails dirty and you're just going to get calluses and you're just going to work your butt off. And that's just the way it is. And it takes time. But you have to have the right why and the right drive. And if it becomes money, then you're in trouble. Do you guys hear this? Uh, a little. Well, is that, is that okay? Sounds good. All to right. Me. Will you're says good. it's okay. We, we've got a weed whacker or a blower in the background. Sorry, folks. It's sunny and beautiful in San Diego, so I'm just going to allow you to suffer with that blower. Yeah, if you're not watching on YouTube, it, your background looks fake. So your sister has a beautiful backyard. Dude, yeah. It's like Tuscany. It's gorgeous where she lives. <laughs> Yeah. Um, well, thank you for sharing that failure. Um, you talked earlier about the powerful or the power of questions. And I'm curious, you ask questions for a living. Uh, do you have a favorite go-to question or two that no matter what leader you're with, you always ask? You know, it's not so much of a, a leader. It's more of strangers. You know, when I meet strangers, I usually, will usually just say, Hey, tell me three or five things, um, that will three to five things that will help me to know truly who you are. Not what you do, but I want to know who you are. So what are like three to five things I need to know to best understand who you are? And I like that question. You know, that, that one always helps me, whether I'm with a, a young person or somebody older than me. I love it. Um, do you have a biggest leadership pet peeve? Yeah, it's just self-centeredness, selfishness. Yeah, leaders who are in leadership for the wrong reasons. 
Um, do you have any unusual habits personally that enable you to be successful? Don't ask me such questions. <laughs> unusual habits? You know, I thought about unusual. Yeah, I mean, for me, sitting in the ocean and surfing is not usual, uh, but that helps me to be the best version of me. So I like to do that often. I think, uh, you know, unusual. Many leaders don't really put their health as a high priority. And I believe that better humans make for better leaders and how we feed and exercise and sleep and how we care for ourselves. It, uh, it matters. It's not the norm. And when you get momentum in that area, it bleeds over into all areas. So I'm uh, married to an amazing woman who's a, got a very organic naturopathic um, passion. And, uh, and I've been a, a self health care guy, you know, working out and training and all that. And, since I was 14. So not all that yeah. usual. We all know we should do it, but that's part of who I am. Do you have uh, do you have two or three items on your bucket list or life plan that you, you want to do that you haven't done yet? Not really. I don't have a bucket list. I'm so content. You know, I want to continue adventure and continue to explore and continue to be used to make a difference. But you know, if I were if I uh, found myself uh, on my deathbed today, and I, I, there's not a lot that I would regret other than the opportunity to do life with those that I love most. And I'm, I'm a content guy. So you talked about adventuring. Has there been any adventures that you went on that you're saying, hey, at some point in your life, you should do this? What would you tell people? Well, it's good you're asking me that, not my wife. My wife and I have had several near deaths on a lot of our adventures. And she would sit there and just say, you're we're done. Like you, you go and I'm staying back. But, uh, you know, I, I, I like, so with my passion for surfing, I've, I've been to some pretty cool parts of the world. So whether it be South Africa or the Maldives or Fiji, you know, I, I'm addicted. I have been doing it for my whole life. So I go to some cool spots. The Maldives are beautiful. Uh, absolutely beautiful. Um, amazing. Uh, Croatia. I, I went on, that was a fun one, just like right before COVID. So 19, I took I took my, at that time, 15, maybe 16 year old daughter, my youngest. And we, uh, after, so this is fun. This is a good adventure. Hey dads, if you have young kids, create experiences and memories and, and moms do the same thing. Um, but what I did was I told, I, I've gone on adventures with each of my kids and my youngest was up. So I'm like, all right, here's the deal. Backpacks. You can have the first night lodging and the last night lodging set. We're going anywhere you want. There's no planning in between. And we're going to be gone for 14 days. Passports required. Pick it. So we wound up in, in Italy, then in Croatia. And in Croatia, we were on an island and um, in the Adriatic Sea. And they, were, they would rent these little teeny Zodiac boats for a few hours, like a little lifeguard Zodiac boat for a few hours. Well, I stayed in that town for two days negotiating and proving that I could drive a big boat until finally they allowed me to take the boat for five days. What? So my daughter and I, a little ice chest backpacks, and uh, we took this little Zodiac and we took it through the Adriatic Sea all through Croatia, not knowing where we we're going, ee, cruising around going, hey, there's an island, let's go over there. Looking on our GPS, we'd get there, all right, are there Airbnbs here? She'd be looking, I found an Airbnb. We'd pull in, guys, so cool. Croatia's wow. beautiful. Yeah, I've heard that. Well, hey, I'm 35, but if you're looking to adopt anyone, I'd be, I'm available. Yeah. That sounds incredible. Yeah, yeah, you, 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 yeah. you, don't, you don't want to be adopted by me. <laughs> Uh, if you could go back and have coffee with 20 year old Danny or Daniel at that time, what would you tell him? I would have accelerated my acknowledgement of passion and purpose, like get, figure it out and just get after it. Yeah. The 20 year old me, um, I was, I was still chasing the wrong things. So the 20 year old, the 30 year old me, but you see, I don't have regret because so much of my twenties taught me what I needed to learn in order to become who I am in my fifties. So I would just say continue to take risk and continue to figure out your purpose and passion and just figure out how to incorporate more hours into that. Um, then you get to go to work. Then you get to live out who you are, regardless of whether you're on the clock or not. There's just core integrity. You know, you're, you're getting to do what you want to do. Flipping switches up. 
Yeah, I usually end by asking leaders what they want their legacy to be, and you've written your eulogy a few times. <laughs> so what do you want to be remembered for? You know, it's, you know, how I made you feel. How I made you feel. Did I make you feel special? Did I make you feel like you were created for something good? Did I make you feel like you could when everything around you was telling you maybe you couldn't? It, it all has to do with that I loved them, how I loved them. And you know, for me, with my faith, that means they experienced a little bit of Christ in me and in my interaction with them. Well, I can say that you've certainly done that for me. You inspired me today. You gave us a lot Yay. of practical things. Um, this is a wonderful interview. Um, as we close, Thank is you. there anything else you would want to leave leaders with today? Yeah, so just know that this is being recorded on, uh, it's tax day, isn't it? Well, yeah. If everything would have been postponed, it would have been taxed. <laughs> so April 15th, 2021 is when we're doing this. Yeah. And what we've most recently experienced is everything from the pandemic to the world shutdown to uh, extreme social injustice and radical horrific evil that we've watched to polarization of a nation through any and every facet, politics through health practices. And, um, and, and our people are fatigued and our people are scared and um, our people are spent. And we need to take really good care of ourselves so that we can best take care of others. Now is a time for leaders to move to the offense. You are responsible for taking your business, your organization forward, whatever that looks like for you, whether it's market share or performance, you need to be growing. And um, in so doing, you need to continue to be shepherding and caring for people. Um, I would also say, you know, I do a CEO roundtable where I have CEOs and chairman of boards that come together. We've been coming together regularly since the beginning of the pandemic, but I'm talking with guys like Frank Blake, who's the chairman of Delta Airlines, Horst Schulte, one of the co-founders of Ritz-Carlton Hotels, Martin Dom, chairman of Daimler, Mercedes-Benz, trucks out of Stuttgart, Germany, Tim Tosopoulos, uh, Chick-fil-A. I mean, all sorts of guys and gals, Phyllis Campbell, uh, Chase, um, yeah, all sorts of amazing people. And um, the big thing that has been coming in the last few sessions that we've had is one that you really need to reconnect your organization to the greater why, like mission and purpose, and it needs to make a difference in the community. You've got to figure out how to tie the work of your people and your business to making it better for others. I don't care if you're making a widget that goes in this computer or whether there's a product or service that's like, very obvious, figure it out. The second thing is, meritocracy still matters. And you, you need to be elevating top performers and you need to be looking for top performers and building leadership capacity and bench. And in today's times where it's very difficult because many haven't worked together, that's kind of fallen to the wayside, but get back on the offense on that and um, be looking for tomorrow's talent, look for tomorrow's innovators and look for the people that have that energy to help you to move into that offense mode full blown because there's going to be all sorts of opportunities that are uh, coming our way, all sorts of opportunities. Well, Daniel, thank you so much. This was rich. Um, thanks again. And I uh, look forward to, to posting this so everyone can listen to it. Thank you for allowing me to be with you, Doug, Will. Will, thank you for doing what you're doing to make this uh, multiply. Appreciate it. Appreciate your smile and your energy. And Doug, thanks for everything you're doing. You're doing amazing stuff. Hey, Leader, thank you so much for listening to my conversation with Daniel Harkavy. I hope that you enjoyed it as much as I did. You can find ways to connect with him, his organization, and links to everything that we discussed in the show notes at l3leadership.org forward slash 277. Leader, if you want to 10x your growth this year, I really want to challenge you to either launch or join an L3 Leadership Mastermind Group. Mastermind groups are groups of 6 to 12 leaders that meet on a consistent basis for at least one year in order to help each other grow to their maximum potential, achieve their goals, and to do life together. Mastermind groups have been the single greatest source of growth in my life over the last six years. So if you're interested in learning and more about launching or joining an L3 Mastermind, go to l3leadership.org forward slash mastermind. And as always, I like to end with every episode with a quote, and I'll quote Gerald Brooks again today. He has so many great quotes. He said this, he said, as a leader, you need to create a relationship vault. You need to invest in relationships today because you will need them tomorrow. 
And I just want to encourage you, leaders, don't get so focused on work and achieving things that you neglect relationships. It will be one of the most, the biggest mistakes you ever make in your entire journey. Invest in relationships today because you will need them tomorrow. I hope you enjoyed the episode. Laura and I appreciate and love you so much, and we will talk to you next episode. 